I want you to take your Bibles, if you would please, go over to Romans 11. What a chapter and what a section of passages in the Scriptures. Chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul's heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they would be saved. He could wish himself to be cursed for them. And here we come, and he's talking again about the Israelites that are scattered. They're in Rome at this time, and he's concerned about them. As one would with such a close familial bond. These people were close. I do believe that the book of Revelation is the field manual of the day of the tribulation. But I've equally come to the conviction that this book of Romans is the field manual for you and me. You are going to be challenged on your salvation. You're going to be challenged on every hand. The world is going to throw at you all kinds of different varieties of Christendom. Some saying you can be saved and you can be lost and you get saved again and lost and saved again. And Some people say you get saved by works and some people say you get saved by baptism. Some people say you can't even know if you're saved or not. And some people say, hath God surely said? And they've said they don't even believe the Bible. You've got a world out there that's just really antagonistic to your stability in Jesus, can I say very clearly? You need to know your Bible personally. I can't tell you the things that God has revealed to me as my life has gone with Him year by year. He teaches me. He brings me alone. But we have to be engaged. And so you have to be engaged in your own time with the Lord. You have to read it for yourself. You have to ask the hard questions. And you have to find those answers. Because if you've got this nagging feeling in the back of your mind that somehow something might be askew, then get that thing figured out. Don't let the devil have a thorn in your paw that makes you limp everywhere you go. God would have His people literally stand square-shouldered and bold for the faith of the Gospel. And that's why He says that the righteous are bold as a lion. If we're not, then possibly it's because we haven't been engaging. So I encourage you to take these things we've been studying and review them if you need to. But reality is, we've been doing a master class, and the book of Romans is the field manual. And if you will take this book and parse it, you will be able to stand. And having done all to stand in the evil day, stand ye therefore. Amen? That's what we want to be. We want to be soldiers in Jesus. The Bible says in verse 1, I say then, hath God cast off his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not? What the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel. We're seeing him tell us that this is a big question mark. Hath God cast off his people? Why would he even think that? This is early in the New Testament period. You're looking at a time where this question may foment down through the centuries. You might say, well, God couldn't do anything with Israel. And people are saying that today. And so I think it's timely that with Israel under the microscope right now of the entire world, we visit this passage. Hath God cast away his people Israel? Because this world is turning dark. And it has to turn dark toward Israel in the end. That battle of Armageddon everybody talks about, that's going to take place in Israel. Right now, we have all of these ships over there. We have all of these different people arrayed. We've got people who are applauding Hamas. We've got people who are applauding Hamas. And that's like, what? (laughs) You know, the world in which we live has lost its mind. It's lost its mind, but it's also, and more importantly, lost its moorings. In all of our history, we've never seen a time where there's been such an irreligious temperature across the world. I can say in applause to the country of Uganda over in Africa, they literally made a law recently to outlaw homosexuality. And you know why they did it? Because they feared for their country. Because they were afraid they would lose their country if they did not please God. They had a a moral but also a spiritual reason saying, I don't want to provoke God anymore. So the whole legislature almost unanimously outlawed it. Now, guys, listen. If you read your Bible, you'll find out there's like four verses where it says, and he took away the Sodomites from the land. That was kings who went deep and they said, we need to deal with this, okay? We need to put this out of our midst because this is odious to the Father. That's not popular. I'm telling you guys, these days we're living in. These days we're living in. As family, you need to realize things matter to God. He's taking notes. And we are in a precarious situation because we've allowed not only that sin, but we've also allowed the transgendering, we've allowed these children to be taken, we've allowed furries, and we've encouraged people with mental illness 
in many cases, uh, more demonization, really, but they call it mental illness. If they would just handle them as if it was mental illness, you wouldn't have all this stuff unfolding. So you and I are living in some strange times. And so it's very interesting to watch the world begin to become more laser-focused on Israel. Israel is a big deal. It's a huge deal. In fact, what you're seeing over there right now, if you put it in its proper setting, the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to make a covenant with Israel to protect them for seven years. That's the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy of the 490-year prophecy, the 70 weeks of years prophecy. And right now, it looks like they might get to the place where they're going to need some protection. So let's bring it, right? Let's bring it because we're out of here when that's done. When that's happening, we're not here. Folks, we're bumping the door. We're knocking on heaven's door. We really are. And many of us would love to get out of here. However, we're not home yet. So we have to do what we can do to represent the kingdom while we're here. And the Bible tells us that we have an understanding of these things. By the way, what you're learning here is also going to help you in your highways and byways because the world's wondering what's happening, what in the world's going on. Now you can tell. Here's another aspect. The Bible says, has God cast off his people? No. Has God cast away his people? No. You need to realize that that is huge. That is important because if he can cast them off, he can cast you off. He's going to say that in this chapter. You and I are a people of God, and we now are in a privileged place. We're a holy nation. We have been called a peculiar people unto God. We are called to show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into light. You and I are not here for us. If we were here for us, God would save us and take us home. He leaves us here to be a witness for his glory. He leaves us here to be a witness to his grace. He leaves us here to bring other people near. And as we do that, hopefully... They will have ears to hear and then be saved because no one's getting out alive. The Bible says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And you need to understand that this word is a very troubling word <laughs> because for the believer, we would think, well, if anybody deserves to be cast away at certain low points in your Christian life. You might have thought, well, I deserve to be cast away. I knew better. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't be that way. And the reality for you and me is, is that this is not what God does. God does not cast away his people. He that cometh unto me, I will in no way cast out. Aren't you glad that's written? Boy, I'm glad it's written. doesn't say if Dave comes to me, I will know I think it's some other Dave. It says if any man comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. This word here actually is only used six times in the Bible, and it's the thing that men do, not the thing that God does. This is the thing that men do, okay? Men cast people away. Men cast away. God's word, cast away, God's work in people's lives, cast away, cast away. But God doesn't do that. In fact, two of the six are right here. In verse 2 it says as well, no, God has not cast away his people. But notice it also says, for I also am an Israelite. So let's just end the argument right there. If God was casting away his people, Paul wouldn't be saved. Okay, He says, listen, exhibit A, I'm here. I am here, and you know what he says of himself in, in Corinthians? He says this, that I am as one born out of due time. Literally, the word is prematurely born, not late, which is kind of odd because it makes you stop and think. What's he talking about? Well, many people in pondering that think that Paul's saying, I kind of identify with those 144,000 Jewish evangelists who nobody could stop. <laughs> okay, so think of 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are like the Apostle Paul going out there and preaching for those seven years. But regardless of what you do with that verse, I want you to know Paul was not just saved. He's what some people refer to as saved, saved. All right? In fact, what he was is he's what the Bible does refer to as an Israelite indeed. You've heard of a widow indeed, and an Israelite indeed. You may remember in Nathaniel's case, the Bible says in John 1, 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming unto him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. An Israelite indeed was somebody who had actually understood by teasing out the realities of the sacrificial system and all of that, that salvation was by grace through faith. Just like, just like, just like Abraham understood. He was a son of Abraham. He was an Israelite indeed. And when Jesus saw him, he declared him to be because he saw him under the tree. He said, how do you know about me? He said, I saw you under the tree. He says, whoa. You know, now we're talking. Because being an Israelite indeed, guess what he got? He got more light. 
If you're God's child, He wants to give you more light. And He just gave Nathaniel huge light. He was alone under a tree, and he was seen by this man right here. And he knew he had purged his soul, and he said he is a man in whom is no guile. You see, Jesus is awesome. Don't ever, ever forget that. He was not just a good teacher. He was not just a great prophet. He was literally the God-man come to earth. The only superhero that ever existed in reality. And all those other ones are just trying to flood the market so you will miss the most important one. The Bible says he is an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And the Bible says in verse 2, in answer, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Now, I, I probably should have exercised you on this. The Bible talks about foreknowledge, right, over and again, and we saw that. And in Peter, it kind of gives a clarity, a, 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 a very concise clarity. It says that he elected according to his foreknowledge, right? This is the foundational issue. First things first, he elected us according to the foundation of his foreknowledge, right? Elect according to the foreknowledge. You need to realize that. You know, you can come from any number of sectors of understanding, but the Bible is clear. We are elect according to his foreknowledge. Whom he foreknew, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Meaning, we are supposed to be being made into the image of Jesus. Which, by the way, is part of your experience if you're a believer. If God's working on you to get you to be more like Jesus through whatever it is, through prosperity, through adversity, through any kind of things that you might go through, discouragements, disappointments, maybe even bereavements, all of these things are to make us more like Jesus. Everything about this life, he experienced. Everything about this life, he understands. He knows what it is to be in your shoes. He knows what it is to be humiliated. He knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows what it is to be bereaved. You remember when John the Baptist had his head taken from his body? The Bible says when Jesus heard, he went into a mountain alone. It was a hard thing. He understood deeply. Even at the tomb of Lazarus, the Bible says he wept, even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. But he wept because he was actually taking... It's what we might call power from this, this terrible bereavement, just drinking in the experience, because it was the Bible talks about those words in that passage of him like a horse that's snorting, ready for battle. And that's very close to the time he was to be crucified. So even seeing what was going on at this tomb was reminding him what he knew in his mind. He would be in a tomb, but also knowing that that tomb was for every person he loved, just like every person we love is one day going into the grave. And he knew it, and he thought, the only hope they have is if I go first. And I go and die for them. And so he wept for that bereavement, but he also was fortifying himself for the cross. Guys, He understands you. He understands me. He understands your tears and He understands your pains. He understands your discouragements and your faintings. The Bible says God had not cast off His people. And in essence, we can tease that out to understand. He won't cast you and me out either because He said He would. We have a more sure word, don't we, in the New Testament. The Bible says, He that cometh unto me, I will in no way cast out. The Bible goes on to say here, He says, Know ye not what the Scripture saith of Elias? How that he make it intercession to God against Israel? You say, what? Against Israel? <laughs> and by the way, it says, of Elias, the Greek word is en, which is either in or by. So it's basically saying what the scripture says, by or in Elias or Elijah. So I'm kind of clarifying some of the terms so you understand what the run is here. You're talking about Elias, which is Elijah. And Elijah was one who really had all things going sideways for him. You remember, he was the discouraged prophet when it was all said and done. He's crying in his mantle and he's saying, Lord, only I am left. And God had to tell him, no, it's not so. But he prayed against Israel because they were so far gone. I'm feeling that today. I'm feeling like the world is so far gone. I remember when I was young in the Lord, I would go to people's homes, I would knock on the door, and they would literally invite me in. All they knew was I was visiting from the church and they would say, oh, come right in. It was eager to get me in. And I'm not talking Christian people. I'm talking people who are unchurched. They would eagerly invite me in, a 23, 24-year-old young man. They would invite me in, sit me down, and they'd say, would you like some tea? Would you like some coffee? I mean, they, didn't even, they don't even know why I'm there. They're just talking to me. 
I'm visiting cold turkey to people's homes and they're inviting me in. Today I go to a door and people say, why are you here? What are you doing here? What do you want? And it's antagonistic. If I'm at work and I'm living out the Christian life every single day in front of them, as some of you know, they don't turn easily. People are aggressively anti-God, anti-Christian today. And that's America. Now, I find those Christians now and again, and I find the ones that are a little meek and sheepish in the background. I had a buddy that uh, lived across from us. We had a little Bible study in Pennsylvania while my kids were real young and before we even started the church. They had a little Bible study in our living room. His name was Rich, and Rich was uh, coming to that Bible study, and one day he was driving home from work, and he pulled off the side of the road because he got started listening to Christian radio and had that Bible study, and he got saved. Became one of our guys in the church that was a very important part of our church in Pennsylvania when we started it. And what's what amazing is, is that he got saved and he's sitting there listening at work on his headset and he's laughing. And the guy says, what are you listening to? And he says, oh, I'm listening to, and it was some preacher on the radio. He says, oh, I know who he is. I, I've heard him too. He said, what? He says, are you, are you a believer? He said, yeah, he's known this guy for five years, sat right next to him. The guy never shared Jesus with him. But my guy can't stand over here. He's like laughing about Jesus right out there in front. And it's just amazing. You and I have to be the light and the salt, or we're not. Don't get a light lit up and put it under a bushel. What I'm trying to tell you is there was a time when I thought I could witness anybody into heaven. And now I feel like Elijah, man, he just brought down the Mount Carmel uh, experience. And, and nevertheless, Jezebel says boo, and he heads for the hill because he's spent, and nobody seems to be protecting him, and nobody seems to be worried. And that, that woman up in the throne room, well, she's going to get me, and i got to run. You see, this world is on its ear, and we are now in a godless society on so many levels. So you need to have your Bible under your belt. And he says, God foreknew his people. He knew and foreknew his people, Israel. In fact, if you were to find it again, it's in 1 Peter 1, 2. The Bible says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Always think that. If you hear the word election, if you hear the word foreknowledge, just try to remember to say that to yourself. Elect according to the foreknowledge. Because God looked down through the corridors of time. He saw who would believe. It's immediately. He knew not everybody would. He knew it. He didn't have to think it through, literally, but he knew it ahead of time that people would believe and people wouldn't believe. And he saw the people that would believe and he said, it was worth it. It was worth it. The Bible says in this passage that he foreknew them. And Romans 8 is where it says, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And it says that he, the Lord Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Why does he the firstborn? Because God foreordained that you and I would have a relationship with God as adopted children. Jesus being the only begotten Son, you and I are then the adoptive children. And He takes us by what? By choice. He said, I chose to let all this unfold. Everything you see that's going sideways in your world, in history, as well as in the present day, God saw you and me. And He said, I'm going in. And Jesus came into the world. And He came to seek and to save what was lost. And He died for us. Gave Himself for us. Now, when you think of these passages about him saying he prayed against Israel, it had been done so often that even in Nehemiah there was a passage where it says, Yet many years didst thou forbear them, Lord, and testified against them by the spirit of your prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hands of the people of the land. Wow. Wow. That's Nehemiah saying, we've been in exile, we're out of exile now, and here we're not doing so great even still, but we're doing the best we can. They've got like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree of a temple and a wall getting built. It's all kind of, uh, you know, kind of precarious, to say the least. And Nehemiah is saying, I just want to go on record as saying, I heard what you said about us, and I get it, because now I'm feeling it and I'm seeing it. Do you see the world as a mess? Do you believe that? Do you see the world as... Darkening? Do you see the, the light dimming? Do you see God being marginalized? And yet God is never marginalized because He's everywhere. He's in everybody's space. He's up in everybody's face. He sees every nuance, every twitch of the eye, every thought. He knows it all. And everyone who thinks He's gone, the Bible says, He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Why? Because He's in charge of everything. and He knows what's going on. He knows what people are thinking before they even have a thought for Him. That is our God. 
And he is going to call to account and into the deep carpet every single man, woman, boy, and girl. And it is upon us right now, as boots on the ground, to do what we can to get some into the family of God and save. People go sideways because people are sinners. And people who are sinners need to be saved. The Bible says in Jeremiah, give heed unto me. And this is Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the one who loved these people with a passion, right? Weeping for them. Give heed unto me, O Lord, and hearken to the voice of them that contend with me. Shall evil be recompensed for good? For they have digged a pit for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good for them and to turn away wrath from them. Therefore, deliver up their children to famine. Pour out their blood by the force of the sword and let their wives be bereaved of their children and be widows and let their men be put to death and let their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses. Then thou shalt bring a troop suddenly upon them for they have digged a pit to take me and hid snares for my feet. Yet, Lord, thou knowest all their counsels against me to slay me. Forgive not their iniquity, neither blot out their sin from thy sight, but let them be overthrown before thee. Deal thus with them in the time of thine anger. Wow. Wow, right? This is a prophet praying these words against Israel. What did God do? (laughs) He didn't wipe them out. He did let the enemies come at times. But he didn't wipe them out. He didn't cast them off. He's saying, listen, did you not know what God did? Through Elias, it says how he made intercession against Israel. Lord, he said, they have killed thy prophets, verse 3, and dig down thine altars, and I am alone left. He says, and they seek my life. This is the same thing Jeremiah went through. What I'm trying to point out is, is that God has everything under control. And when the world goes crazy... And it's starting to get you all crazy because when everybody starts running, you know, it's like everybody else gets in line, so we got to run with them. And then when they run this way, uh, uh, Ukraine, run to Ukraine. <laughs> Israel, let's run to Israel. Everything is all about what's in the mix today to keep people astir, keep people unsettled. And what do you think about Israel? You see, if I stop now, we could go home and some people would say, well, God's done with his people. He's, even his prophets were saying terrible things about them. But you see, you're missing the whole point if that's where we would stop. Because the whole point is he's saying, that may be true and that may have happened. But that is not who God is. God is good even when we're not. Can I get an amen? God is good even when we are not. The Bible says that he that heareth my words and believeth in him that sent me shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. If you are born again, you are his child and he will treat you as his child. And sometimes that may mean a spanking. But as with Daniel and his three friends, they all were were literally taken into captivity. They were literally castrated. You may not have put that together, but that's what they do to those people in the court that would deal with these kings and they didn't want them having any kind of angst that would make them other than servants that were in complete focus of the king. The reason it's important for you to know is that this is because of what happened to Daniel and his friends did not diminish the fact of their faith and their knowledge of who God was. They loved him. And they knew he loved them. And even though this was coming, they understood the bigger picture. And whatever's going on right now has a bigger picture, folks. I told you about it a minute ago. Armageddon takes place over there. And God is just doing some dry rehearsals, I believe, right now. He's doing a couple dry runs to get you and me to be thinking, Armageddon, Armageddon, Armageddon. Yes, because why? Because it's on the agenda. This generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And I believe that because God said that that would be the way it was. We're coming into that time. But that doesn't mean that Israel didn't have some culpability, didn't have some difficulties in the Old Testament. In fact, God talks about it further. In verse 4 it says, But what saith the answer of God unto him, unto these prophets? He says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men. Do you see that? What saith God? I have reserved to myself 7,000. I have a group that I foreknew. I always knew that Abraham would teach his children and his children's children after him. I always knew that Israel would have some that were truly his believing people. And so this is how he answered him. Yeah, they dug down the, the altars in verse 3. Yeah, they tried to take your life and they killed the prophets. You remember Jesus said that? You kill the prophets and you seek to slay me too. Jesus saying it out loud. You are whitewashed sepulchers. You are sons of your fathers who killed the prophets. He was telling them, you Pharisees, you Sadducees. He's telling them 
Now listen, guys, you and I are not exempt from the kind of imposition that the devil puts on people. The devil tries to mess people's minds up. It's a thing where we get so patriotic, and it's not something we don't see in the Scriptures. Think of Jonah. Jonah, go preach to Nineveh, that great city. And Jonah went the other way. Why did he go the other way? Because Nineveh was the greatest threat to the existence, the literal existence of Israel. And he didn't want to be a bad patriot, so he ran the other way. And God put him on a ship, and he put him in a fish, and he put him on a shore, and he put him in a city, <laughs> even though he was going the other way. And he's put you in a place, and a place, and a place, and me in a place, and a place, and a place. And everywhere we go, Paul says, praise be unto God who leads us always in victory in Christ Jesus. Wherever you may be, you are more than a conqueror. You are a delivered child of God, and you go out there with Jesus, and Jesus goes with you. And where we aspire to ultimately arrive at is a position where we can share Jesus with other people. Now, folks, I'm telling you, this is a day where that message is lost. We think church is busyness. We think it is theater. We think it is someone who's going to watch our children for us. There's nothing of that in Scripture. Show me a verse in the Bible where the people in the church were supposed to be teaching the children. It's mamas who teach the children. It's daddies who teach the children. The church was not for the children, and people are choosing churches today on based on whether their children will go with them. Make your children go to church. Take them. I heard a guy saying the other day, you remember those kisses that Grandma gave you on the way out the door? It's kind of like that. He went to church on the way out the door to the church. It's kind of like that, I heard him say. And I thought, wow. I thought, why wasn't Grandma going? <laughs> why wasn't Grandma going? We all need to be in church, right? God didn't have a church made up because it was a, the best he could do. It's because it's what needed to be done. And it was what works. The Bible says that the Lord answered and said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time, Paul reverts to their present time in his writing. He says, even now in this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. This is the only place where the words election of grace is used in the Bible. But don't you like it? <laughs> it works, doesn't it? It's an election of grace. And don't think of it as an election of grace. That is some sort of a, they were, they were rascals, they were bad, so he saved us by his grace. No, we all were rascals, we were all so bad. That's the, the principles of Scripture. Go back and read chapter 3 of the book of Romans and you'll find they've all gone away. There's none that understand, there's none that seek of God. God brings his grace to every single one of us. And we either receive it or we reject it. And the answer of our humanity is the vast majority of people reject it the grace of God. Figure that out for a minute. What does that say about the very core of man's being? I will not bow. I will not confess. I will not submit. Pride is a very, very evil thing. And it's in all of us. We sense it. That's how we can be good ambassadors. We can say, I get it. I get it. And then we can tell them about our Jesus. How he can take away the burdens and take away the bondage and take away the sin and give you something better and more and, and, and futuristic that will never diminish in its beauty and only get better because the older we get, the more we realize. We're going home one day. And sometimes you get real homesick. Okay, because that's almost it's every second just about to see it. I remember at E.B. Hill, the man who was called as a black preacher to come to the Watts riots back in the 90s. He was a preacher of renown in Watts. They brought him out to try to get him to calm people down. There was a lot going on. And what happened was, as he talked about in a message I heard him preach, he said he went to a lady's bedside and he says, Oh, sister, sister, you know, do you mind if I pray for you? And she said, No, don't, don't pray. Don't, don't pray. He said, Oh, sister, sister, did I, did I offend you? Did I, did I do something? She said, No, no, Pastor. You remember the last time I was in here? He said, he said, she said, uh, well, you prayed for me. And I was almost, I was almost gone. And I could see the other side. And you prayed for me and I'm back. So, no, do not pray for me. I'm ready to go home. You see, people don't understand why it is we get a glimmer in our eye when we can cry. Sometimes it's not about the sadness. Sometimes it's about the hope. That gives us lift and sets us free from these, these terrible tendrils that keep us tethered down here. The Bible says 
that this is the election according to grace. And I mentioned a little bit, it's the election of grace. And I, I want you to hear this because this is what the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 5. It says, God has predestined us unto adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So there's your uh, adoptive relationship. This is what God intends for us. He gave us a choice, and when we said yes, he said, come on in. And we were made his children by a new birth. But it says he has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, and to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, there's a lot in just those two verses. That's 5 and 6 of chapter 1 in Ephesians. But what I want you to take away is that this is all to the praise of the glory of His grace. Everybody needs grace. Everybody needs grace. Amazing grace. It can be theirs, but they don't know they need it. So our job, as we are recipients of this grace, is to be good examples of what it does for us. Then it gives us a song when we hurt. It gives us a, a laugh when we lose a loved one because we're going to see them again. We don't lose them. We send them on ahead. And we can find a moment of chuckling and remembrance so it's not a, it's not a betrayal to, to remember because we're going to see them again and we review. And folks, listen, it's never goodbye when you're a believer. It's see you later. And we know that. And it's what gives us hope. We do not sorrow as those who have no hope. We do sorrow, but we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We'll see our loved ones again. And the Bible's telling us here that this remnant that he had, uh, that Elias was thinking there was none, but he said there's 7,000. And God is saying now, even now, there is a remnant in the day of Paul that has been saved by the election of grace. And in verse 6 it says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. And that's very important. There is nothing anyone can do. In fact, the reality is, is that you cannot be saved until you realize there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. You have to understand that. People who get saved as a, maybe what we might call a kicker, a rider on their assurances that they're going to heaven. They think they're going to go to church and get baptized and then they'll come up and be a little happy and they'll play the game and they'll live it out in a way that is somewhat maybe theatrical sometimes, sadly. But the reality is that when you understand that you're poor, wretched, miserable, and blind and you need a Savior, you're in the perfect position to be born again. When you understand you're lost, desperately lost, because your sin is enough to put you in hell for eternity, then you're ready to be saved. People get saved sometimes because they don't want to go to hell. But they've never come to grips with the fact that they have a sin problem. And they need to realize that Jesus came to save us not from hell, but from sin. He saves us from sin, from the power of sin, from the relationship we have with sin. So what does that say about the person who says, I'm saved, but they go on and on in sin? Well, that's a problem. And that's what we call a conundrum. <laughs> because reality is, in all of us, there is still going to be some sin. But people who deliberately sin, First John talks about, he who is born of God does not go on practicing sin. Think about that. And let it wreak fear in your soul in this licentious world we're living. Because we think we're better than people, because we know more than people. And yet, in our own hearts, where are we? We need to be right with God. Because when we cooperate with what God's doing through grace... We then honor Him and bring praise to the glory of His grace. Think about that. That's what it's about. He wants us to be. He said, I don't know how to be. Be to the praise of the glory of His grace. Because He's made you accepted in the book. And sometimes we're in a day where we're being told you've got all kinds of options. You deserve a break today. Anything you need, jingle. It's all about you. But the Bible says no. No, it's all about others. It's all about others. And we need to live for others, not for our own devices. The Bible says if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Now, the word grace is a very interesting word. It just simply means the idea of a gift. It has the idea of graciousness in the sense of, uh, of something you don't deserve. Uh, in other words... Grace is getting what you don't deserve. If somebody goes before the law and they have broken the law, they're in front of the judge and the judge looks at them. And justice would be perhaps a huge fine in jail time. But the judge is kind of feeling good that day. 
And so he's thinking about this, and he knows it was an accident, and he's looking at it with different eyes than he normally would. And he not only says, you know, uh, you know, today you're, you're in luck. I'm feeling good. Everything's going good in my life right now, and I've actually received some grace in my own life from something. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to I'm going to look the other way on this. We're going to give you a little little something, but nothing serious. You're going to go, and I'm going to give you mercy. We're not going to you're, you're dismissed. Your case is dismissed. We're going to let it go. You'd say, well, that's that's nice. Well, that's mercy. But grace is something other than. What if it was his son in front of that bar? Now they would recuse him and say no. What if it was his son in front of that bar? And he says, listen, in front of this courtroom, I'm going to tell you this is my son, and I've seen him, and he's going through this terrible time, and it can ruin his life. It could change the whole trajectory. So I'm not going to let him off completely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take what he has done, and I'm going to transmute it to myself. And I'm going to take the punishment, and I'm going to pay the fine, and I'm going to spend the jail. Did he deserve that? No. Would the people in the courtroom be struck by that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a son. They would understand it. What would the son be? No, Dad, no. No, no! If he loved his father. I'm just trying to illustrate for you. We would sometimes say, right? Boy, I wish it was me, not my son, had to go through my daughter had to go through. The Bible says if, if it's of grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. You don't deserve this. You and I do not deserve this. Do you know that God put Adam and Eve out of the garden because they took one piece of fruit from one tree one time? One. How many sins have we committed as individuals? We couldn't even name. We couldn't even begin. Let's take last week. Just last week. How did you do with your tongue, your anger, your temper, your thoughts? You see, you and I, we have to realize it's a grace because we, realizing it's grace, can then begin to look at other people a little bit better. Because you can't see other people clearly until you see yourself clearly. He says, and if it be of grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace, otherwise work is no more work. You can't have works and grace. You can't be getting yourself to a place where you think you're saved and then... You know, you think you got to help God save you. Because if you think that, then you're diminishing what grace is. If you add grace and works together, they literally cancel each other out. Can't be both. It has to be one or the other. And it is by grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not saved through, but unto good works. The Bible says, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh after, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, this word obtained is interesting. Does that mean there's something you should be trying to obtain? Well, let me give you a background on this word. The word literally means to make ready or bring to pass. Is used in certain tenses through the idea of effecting. Now, think of the word effecting. Cause and effect. Okay? Cause and effect. So it's, it's, it's used in the idea of effecting properly then to affect. Now, this is a little complicated, but it says further, it specifically has the idea of to hit or to light upon something as a mark to be reached. And I was reminded as I pondered that word, Hebrews 2.1, the Bible says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to those things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them drift by. You see, grace comes in everybody's life. Grace comes around and it knocks on the door and it's tapping the fences of your life. And some people miss it. But those who obtain it are people who have maybe had their minds primed. Okay, the Israelites had their sacrifices and they realized it didn't work. And when grace made its introduction to them, they would grab hold of it and say, okay, I realize it can't be this because this is just ritual. This makes sense. And then they begin to go back and look at Abraham. Oh, he wasn't even having, he didn't even have a sacrificial system. And then they go back and look at Isaac and Jacob. And, and they look at the sacrifice that was going to be made on the hill of Isaac and all these things. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. And they hit upon it. They hit upon it. Obtaining. It's literally being ready when it comes your way. That's why parents need to recognize they need to prime their children now. Because when grace comes by, they'll recognize it. That's powerful. But that's what he's saying. 
And it got so bad in Israel, only 7,000 men were not bowing the knee. And they weren't all priests and prophets. They were just 7,000 that didn't bow. And I'm telling you, what you and I are living in today is that if you will not teach your children, the devil will be happy to. If we won't teach our grandchildren, the devil will be happy to. And that's where we take our kids to church sometimes, and we think the people in the church need to be teaching them. You have no idea what those people are teaching you. Video games and music and all that, they're teaching them church as a party and a celebration rather than teaching them they need to trust Jesus. You know the clamor doesn't help a person come to Jesus. That's why they used to play hymns of invitation quietly so people wouldn't be intruded upon in their contemplation. People need to look inside. You can't do that when you're being told to reach up, reach up, reach up before you've ever gotten saved. This world is insidious and they're after your seed. The word blinded literally means to petrify. It means that which is to endurate, which has the idea of render stupid or callous, to harden. So when it says it's sort of like having cataracts in your eyes. Remember when Paul got saved, the Bible talks about he couldn't see for a couple of days, and he was in there for three days blind, and then his scales fell off of his eyes. That's what happens when people get saved. The Bible says, in verse 7, What then? Israel hath not obtained. What then? Well, Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So he's saying part of the Israelites were saved. He was one of them. Some of the people in Rome were some of them. And he's writing to. He says, and they were saved, and he says, look, he says, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, and eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. And let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Now this is where you're talking about a psalm. And in this psalm is where David is reflecting upon Dog. Dog was a worthless man. The Old Testament used the word worthless fellow. He was a worthless fellow who worked in the service of Saul. And David got the showbread and he ate it. And Ahimelech, the priest, gave it to him. And when he gave it to him, he ate this showbread. And then he gave him the sword of Goliath because he was running for his life. And when Saul got word that this happened through Dog, Saul not only slew Ahimelech, but all the priests, like over a hundred priests. What an amazing thing. So this prompted a psalm from David that said these words, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Literally, this king in Israel slew the priests in Israel, including the high priest. You see, there is no end to evil. You say, yeah, I never did that. Yeah, but what did you do? Because it doesn't matter what he did. Remember John and Peter? He said to Peter, when you're older, you're going to be bound. And he says, well... What about John? He says, that's none of your business. <laughs> Don't worry about that. What's that to you? It doesn't matter what Israel did. He's just saying, listen, yeah, we know we got problems in our house, and it's bad, but there's always a remnant because there always will be because God is God and He never, ever fails. And He will have some the Israelites and deeds like Nathaniel and Paul and all those 144,000. There will be a bunch, but it's not going to be all that it should have been. The Bible says that he prayed this about them. Verse 11 says, I say, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Why does God leave the Israelites as a people out of the realm of things for a season? You know, 70 AD, 33, Jesus was crucified. 70 AD, Jerusalem was decimated until 1948. It's a long time, okay? This hadn't happened in Paul's writings yet. It's gonna. And he says, listen, God's going to use the church. Why? Because the Gentiles weren't getting salvation from the Jews, so I had to bypass them. You know what's really cool is in the book of Revelation, the Bible says there's a point in chapter 14, I believe it is, that the angels are going to preach the gospel. (laughs) Because it's so important, he's going to break protocol, and he's going to let the angels preach the gospel out loud to all the world. That's powerful. God's breaking protocol a little bit. He's put in parentheses, you and me. We're here. We're supposed to be telling people about Jesus, not living our best life now. My best life is in heaven, by the way. I can guarantee you that. (laughs) This is a tough one down here now, isn't it? Life's hard. You get bumps. You get bruises. You get bit. You get hurt. You stumble. You disappoint others. You disappoint yourself. It's kind of a crazy time. 
But we have a Savior who picks us up every single time and never leaves. The Bible says, God forbid, all these, God forbid, but rather through their fall, in verse 11, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Uh, several of the words, for to provoke. Why did God come to you and me? He wanted us to be to the praise of the glory of His grace, and He wanted the Gentiles to be a provocation to the Jews to want it too. How are we doing? How are we doing? I think it was Gandhi who said, I like the teachings of Jesus, he says, but every Christian I see gives me pause about ever thinking that that might be the actual way of salvation. Now, that should not be said of any of us in our circles. We ought to be people who think, I can't do everything, but I can do something, and I'm going to do what I can do. Okay? That's how it's done. You can't look at John, Peter. You can't look at John. And we can't be looking at the Jews. And we can't be looking at other Christians. But we can say, listen, the commentary from the world has not been all that positive. The Bible says, now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? He says, listen, God can save them. Had God cast them off? No, he always had a remnant. No, he always had a plan. No, he actually came to you because he wants to provoke them to get up on the horse and start riding again because they can and they should and they will. But he's going to do it through a program that he knew from the beginning. It was always going to be this way. And for you and me, we can't lose our minds because all of the lemmings of the world are going against Israel, saying it's terrible, it's bad. And, and if you read some people who even didn't have a reason to say that. And you go that way, but those people who say, well, God, they were in, you know, it was knocked out in 70 AD and when there was no Israel before 1948, some people were saying, we are the new Israel. That's why you talk about some people say this is the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is Sunday. No, it isn't. Sabbath day is Friday to Saturday. Friday night to Saturday night. This is Sunday. Some people say, well, you've got the devil's curse on you. Boy, listen to some of the nonsense people say. Seventh day Adventists say it's the mark of the beast to worship on Sunday. Do you know that they went to synagogue on Saturday to witness? And they came together on Sunday to get their game face on and to get edification. Because why? Because redemption eclipsed creation in the amazing works of God. The one commemorates creation, the Sabbath day. We commemorate redemption. It far eclipses creation. Now, the other side of it is, if you want the Sabbath, we got it in chapter verse 9 of Hebrews, where it says, we have a Sabbatism. And it's every day, all the time, we have entered into the rest, the Sabbath of Jesus. Through his work, because he sort of satisfied everything. Being in him, we have perfect righteousness. So let it be an end to that nonsense. The Bible says in verse 12, it says, Now if the fall of them be the riches and the diminishing of them be the riches, it says, How much more the fullness? So if they got saved, how much more would that be? If you've ever met a new believing Jew, they usually are very, very fired up. And it says in verse 13, For I speak unto you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means that I might provoke to emulation, them that were my flesh. Now this is interesting because the word emulation is the same word that was used up there for the word jealousy. It's the exact same word. And what he's trying to tell us is he wants us to be provoking the people of Israel in verse 11 to jealousy or emulation. He says, I'm even willing to use you. I want you Gentiles to know as your apostle, I'm going to use you to help provoke them to jealousy. I want you to know that is one of your tasks. Not just to witness to everybody, go ye all the world and preach the gospel, but to also provoke the Jews. Listen, God wants you and me to have our children. We want, he, he wants us to use our children to witness to the world. You're not going to be here forever. They are your hereafter. You prime them now, they'll be witnessing when you're long gone. Their voice will continue. You say, well, that's, that's, that's kind of you know, limited. Well, the Bible says in Malachi chapter 2.15, it says, And did not God make them two, those two people, one flesh? Remember that? They too shall become one flesh in marriage. He says, Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And why are they made one? That God might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none tre deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. That's in chapter 2, verse 15 of the book of Malachi. Why did he make a man and woman one? That he might have a godly seed. That he might have a godly seed. That he might have a godly seed. Don't let them make up their own mind. They'll make up their mind in due time. You give them their mind while they're being coming along, while they're growing up, while their minds are firing on all these cylinders. Kids can read at age three. Um, Susanna Wesley had her son reading at his, her bedside the King James English Bible at age three. 
we just we just have been told by the world they're just they're just their own little humans and they can be their own little people. Yeah, you tell them to go to bed. They say, oh, I'm not going to go to bed. You say, go to bed anyway. You tell them to brush their teeth, eat their vegetables, all that nonsense, right? It's like that doesn't even matter compared to salvation. You need to be telling about Jesus all morning, all day, all night. You need to be singing about Jesus. You need to be showing them Jesus. You need to let them catch Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's caught, not taught as much, uh, so much as it is uh, caught. Genesis chapter 18, the Bible says of Abraham, and this is part of their moorings, it says that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep my, the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and the Lord may bring, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken unto him. He knew Abraham, and he knew he would teach, and he knew he would teach well, and he knew that his sons and his sons' sons would come after him. The Bible says, for if, in verse 15, if the casting away of the, of the Israelites be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them but, the, but life from the dead? Now, that's what God specializes in. He specializes in raising the dead. Listen, this is one of those things about, you know, the, the, red, the casting away again. It came back around. This is a different word. This is a word that literally has the idea of loss. It says, and if the loss of them... He didn't cast them away. The word literally means loss. It says, if the, if, the, if the casting away or the loss of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them again? So it makes sense as an antithetical statement. Loss and receiving. And it says of them be, but life from the dead. You realize Romans chapter 8, verse 11 talked about this, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. You're dead to sin, you're free from sin, so you're just sitting there having a good time being free. But he's also in there quickening you, making you alive. This is life eternal that they may know God, uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent, as it says in chapter three, uh, chapter 17, John 17, 3. And so here we have him saying again that the loss of them would be eclipsed in such an awesome miracle, such an awesome testimony to the grace of God that he would receive them again. So now, let's talk about the people who might be out there saying, well, I'm anti-Israel, I hate Israel, all Israelites are bad. Well, you could say that to America. Uh, Israel, uh, America's got a lot of blood on its hands. We've made mistakes. We've had wars we shouldn't have had. We've done things we shouldn't have done. We've left some of our boys on the, on the field. There's no person that is, is able to govern a world and do it well without sin because we're all sinners. That's why our forefathers said, hey, we're going to, our founders have said that we're going to have three branches of government and that's going to keep checks and balances. We're going to keep an eye on each other. That's why this happened. And it was great until it wasn't. Right now it's not. John, uh, Jim Jordan should have been the speaker. By rights, it was time. It was ready. We we're all sitting there saying, what? Why is this taking so long? Let's get on with this. No. But in the big picture, God raises up one and puts down another. Why? Because he wants you to see what's true, what's right, what's wrong. You and I are living in a dystopian world because God wants you and me as believers to realize this is not home. This is not home. And when we get home, it's going to be great. King Jesus will be there apart from sin. And you and I get to rule and reign with him because we also will be apart from sin. I sometimes wonder about that whole me helping reign thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just look in the mirror for a minute. How can we do that? Because we are going to be fully sanctified when we arrive. Our mortality is going to put on immortality. Our mortal is going to put on immortality. Our, our, our corruptible is going to put on incorruption. That's going to be swallowed up with light. And we will be in His presence. We will see His face. We will be free from sin and all of its movements. Beloved, you and I are on our way home. So I say this in closing, verse 18. Boast not against the branches. I skipped down to this because I was going to try to get to this, but do not boast against the branches, meaning the original branches, which were the olive tree branches, because you were a wild olive branch. He says he grafted you in a minute ago, but he says don't boast against the branches because if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root bears you. Did you hear that? That means you are not bearing the cross. The cross is bearing you. If you're anti-Semitic, if you've got a bone in your core that says, I hate Jews because of X, Y, or Z, or whatever you've been told to hate people for, he says, the cross is bearing you. You're not bearing the cross. Part of bearing the cross is affiliating with the lowly. 
understanding God's plan in spite of the fact that you may not understand what's going on in the minutia of the moment. What we have to do is we realize he told us two times what your job is as God's children is to make them jealous for the grace of God that they see in you. Whatever may be on the high things, your job and my job is to make them jealous. To make them want to mimic you because you understand the grace of God. And the grace of God afforded you. It never went off the table for them. He picked Abraham. Abraham was going to teach his children. He had a remnant. He always had a remnant. He has a remnant today. And you and I need to recognize that there are bad people in every culture, in every nation, in every group of people. There are bad people. Even in our own families. Everybody, I say sometimes, has an Uncle Fester. And those of you who know the monsters know what that means. <laughs> so I say to you, are you bearing the root or is the root bearing you? It's not again. Very much.